What would it like to be dead? We exist after death. We do believe that there are other locals. What happens after death before we take a birth in some other physical form? We go to different locals which are different worlds. Some of them may be unpleasant. They are what are called hells or lower worlds. This is there in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna teaches it also. The Yoga Sutras speaks about a lot of Siddhais, occult powers. I have myself seen a little bit like telepathy, knowing what's in the thoughts of another person. Of all the spiritual super occult powers, far higher, far greater is this grace rate. Thank you so, so much for being on my podcast, Under the Tree. It's a pleasure having you. I know people wait for years to have you on their show. This is a really big honor. Thank you, Amira, for having me on your podcast. I'm 23 years old, and I know that we, the youth, we are suffering on a daily basis, whether it's relationship problems, whether it's failures, rejections, career issues. And we often just go to external things to alleviate that, right? We go out drinking, we go out, you know, to the club, because we think that's going to release our suffering. Now, because we don't know who we are, and I guess we don't realize that the suffering is because of the lack, lack of awareness. My question is that, do you think that if the youth begins to have this self-inquiry process, can they alleviate their suffering without being dependent on external factors? Absolutely. You know, I think it's helpful to start with yourself. Yes. Instead of starting with a spiritual teaching or a spiritual master, start with oneself. And then I begin to see that the way I'm leading my life, it is not giving me lasting happiness or fulfillment is giving me some kind of pleasure once in a while and a lot of unhappiness and a mounting sense of you know futility despair and then the spiritual teachings of different paths and different masters they begin to make sense so for example i see that whatever i've tried to do in my life i've tried to do it for myself to make this one person happy and then we notice that it hasn't worked. Yeah. It hasn't worked. I've been doing it, as you said, 23 years from babyhood to childhood to teenage to, you know, uh, youth. Mm -hmm. We are, we have been trying different ways to make ourselves happy. Mm -hmm. It's not working. When we look around and other people, we see, we see that it's not working also. So. And yet there are some people who are happy, who are fulfilled. Um, and when we look into their lives, we find certain common characteristics which if you put them together, that's what's called spirituality. Yeah. Selflessness instead of selfishness. Focus instead of distraction. Love instead of yeah. desire. And knowledge of the self, of who or what we are, rather than knowledge of the world. So these are certain core ideas around which all spiritual paths are built. The claim of spiritual life is that Fulfillment is actually possible. You see, people try to get fulfillment from the world, as you said, through relationships, through sense pleasures, in many ways, it's occupation, job. And they get mixed results, mostly um, kind of futility, unhappiness. Temporary. Temporary. And then people get this idea that maybe this is the best that's possible. And nothing more than it's possible. Then this is possible. Spirituality comes in here, yoga, Vedanta, the different spiritual paths, they say that no, deep uh, fulfillment is possible, overcoming suffering is possible. So my answer to your question would be, start with yourself, see that there is a growing dissatisfaction with life and then there is this promise that deep satisfaction is actually possible. Then which reasonable person wouldn't, you know, try to at least inquire? Uh, and practice that. With the path of Jnana, the path of knowledge, how can the youth practically implement those three stages of uh, listening, hearing, contemplating, and meditating? If you can briefly explain. Yes. Um, this is preeminently an age of uh, reason and experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was a time in the past when one could say that um, follow religion because I say so or because the books say so or spiritual masters say so. Maybe at one time it, that was so, but yeah. right now it's no longer really possible. Uh, right now, uh, and I think it's a good thing that people want evidence. People want actual concrete proof. Um, and Jnana Yoga is actually very suited to that, the path of knowledge, path of Advaita Vedanta. 
because it starts with yourself. It doesn't start with a God or a promise of a heaven. Uh, it starts with what we are and who we are. And the, you know, it's very easy, very interesting to compare the paradigms that are available to us. There's one paradigm of spirituality which is a devotional paradigm. We are told that there is God. Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga. And you believe in God. Have faith, um, love, devotion, surrender, prayer. That's the way. The problem with that is it's not so easy to have that kind of faith, at least at the beginning. Yeah. Then there is another path, the yogic path. I mean, you're calling it the yogic path, but it's found in various forms across the world in different religions. Um, that path says, not faith, not belief, but experience. So I will show you certain techniques and you follow these techniques and you will get some extraordinary experiences, which will prove to you the claims of religion. So like Vivekananda said, if God exists, can I see God? Yeah. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. Mm -hmm. So this demand for empirical experience, empirical proof, uh, the yogi path is specially suited. I see that you on the table, you have the, the Raja Yoga the Raja book. Yoga. Yes. So this is preeminently a yogic path. It's okay. based on the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Okay. And Swami Vivekananda, in fact, I think quite deliberately, this was the first book that he translated uh, and he taught in the United States. It was published from the Vedanta Society of New York, actually. Oh, wow. okay. But there too, there is a slight um, hitch, a slight problem, if I may put it that way. The problem is this. Yogic path will give you experiences, but what kind of experiences? Those are extraordinary experiences. Samadhi-based experiences, what you might call mystical experiences. Kundalini uh, uh, awakening, uh, superconscious states of, uh, um, of the mind. Um, so, what one might call mystic experiences, visions and the like. And that's great. There are genuine mystical experiences which saints and mystics throughout the ages in different religions have testified to it and those are life transforming. And it's a worthwhile path to pursue. The only difficulty is, there too there's a possibility of skepticism uh, because... Uh, who knows whether it's true? Who knows whether the, the, you're having a mystical experience or you're just high or you're having a neuroscientist would say that you have a stroke in your brain or something. That's what's making you feel that oh, you're one with, you know, you feel that you're one with the universe, but actually you are not. It's just a, a problem with your brain or something. So mystical experiences can be doubted. Okay. One reason is because they are not common experiences, right? So they are extraordinary. They are rare. Sri Ramakrishna is having a vision of Mother of Ma Kali. But if you read the description, he is an ecstasy. He is having the vision. But all the people around him, they are not having that they vision. Yeah. They used to call him crazy. They used to call him crazy, most of them. Some of them believed him. Some who were spiritually advanced, they felt that, that ecstasy in the presence of Sri Ramakrishna. But most people, at least at that time, they would think, you know, he's, he's, he's a mad Brahmin of the Dakshinesh, the priests of, priest of Kali and so on. And mystics of all ages have had to face that, uh, that charge, that, that you're just crazy, you're just plain mad. The peculiar advantage of the path of Advaita Vedanta is, it doesn't say that you have to believe in something. No, you have to understand, you have to realize it. It also doesn't say that you have to wait for extraordinary mystical experiences. It says our daily experiences, just like this, we are talking to each other, um, the experience of subject and object in this world. Who doesn't have that? All of us, all our experiences are subject and objects. Or the experience of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Who doesn't have a waking experience? All of us, we are awake. We dream. We also go into deep sleep. And Vedanta says that's enough to begin the inquiry into what we are. The experience of the five levels of the human personality. You know, the physical body, the vital body, the mental body, the intellect, and beyond that. Everybody, all of us, we have that. What Vedanta does is, it draws our attention to something that's already there, not a future mystical experience. Right here, right, right now. here, right now, everybody has it. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, whether you believe in Vedanta or not, that doesn't matter. What we need is your attention towards the most favorite subject of each one of us, we ourselves. Yeah. So you have to attend to your own experience of yourself and we need reasoning. We're going to reason, logically find out something in our own experience. So that's the beauty of Advaita Vedanta because it, it roots the uh, spiritual search in experience and reason. And again, experience means 
not the yogic kind of experience which says that do this in future you will have some spectacular yogic experience all true all possible and it happens all the time but it's rare and it's still in the future but here we are talking about our quotidian experience daily experience and an inquiry into that so that's right the beauty now, of the advaitic approach yes. when we both are speaking yes and this is in the present moment yes so who is speaking it's not my mind it's not my thoughts it's my are we both the consciousness that basically shining on both of us right right but you do it this way i am having this experience this my experience of life itself right now and here is this universe which i'm experiencing in fact vedanta says notice the nature of the experience there are forms which you are seeing there are sounds which we are hearing birds yeah. the sounds which we are hearing um smell taste touch then look inwards not just the sense experience we are also having experiences subtle experiences within uh, thoughts memory um the ego the sense of i all of these whether external uh, objects like form and taste and is coming from the world outside or internally generated all of these are objects which we are experiencing now what is it that is experiencing all of it we will immediately say i am experiencing but what's the nature of that i is it a body and the body is also an object i can see the body yeah. i can um, touch it. it taste it yes is it the mind the mind is also something that i can experience a first person internal experience when we in introspect so these are all objects appearing to me in that case if the body is also an object to me if thoughts and feelings are also objects to me then i must be something that is not body and mind and i that one also must be aware because it's having all these experiences so this bodiless awareness this awareness which transcends mind and thinking this is who i am by experience and by logic first this pointing out is done the the methodology the uh, the logic behind it is understood then we must actually proceed to notice it so there are actual exercises in vedanta for example um you take up an object outside you take up say this um this gerua cloth you are seeing the gerua cloth and you notice the eyes are seeing the cloth the eyes are different from the cloth yeah. then you now you have to focus your attention away from the cloth to the eyes themselves you blink the eyes and open the eyes you notice the eyes themselves then the eyes become the object of my experience and who is experiencing the mind the mind is the seer and the eyes are the seeing now seen within coach yeah. then you draw your attention to the mind itself thoughts emotions ideas um, memory those are also objects there's something behind the mind something some i won't even say someone some awareness now which one am i am i an object out there or something in here we we'll always say i am in here i am here the object is there then i am here the object is the eyes i am there the object is the mind and i am that awareness and then you notice physical problems illness weakness um old age even death that's of the body which is an object to me mental ups and downs depression unhappiness um, even pleasure and pain they are in the mind i am the awareness because the awareness itself is different from the body and different from the mind the awareness is not something that undergoes old age disease or death awareness is not overweight the body is overweight right. the awareness is not um, you know um, sick the body can be sick awareness is not uh, depressed or frustrated it's the uh, mind which is depressed or, or frustrated i am aware of it but i am not it it's an argument it's like a logical bit of reasoning but actually what you do is you begin to see this sit quietly and notice this then your very conception of yourself begins to change body is still there with its problems the world is still there with its problems the mind is still there with its problems but i find within myself an entirely problem free existence and from that perspective now i can engage with the mind and the body and the world in a much more calm powerful and effective way not in 
that some writer wrote, most men live lives of quiet desperation. So not in a way of desperation. Yeah. You know, inside that, call it the divinity, call it Atman, whatever you call it. But you're perfectly all right there. You're perfectly safe and secure there. From that position, when you deal with the mind and the body and the world, it's a much better way of, of being. Always blissful. You are always um, blissful. In a, you have to be careful with the word. Normally, when they say blissful, um, it's a feeling in the mind. You know, happiness, bliss. Is that awareness blissful? Or the awareness is free of all kinds of problems, all kinds of limitation and suffering. When you see that, there is great peace and happiness in the mind. So that is a spiritual joy. And that does not depend on anything in the world. That's always there. Even if there are problems in the world, your inner peace is always there. The process you just explained. Yeah. So I read a lot about Bhagwan Ramana Maharishi. And I think his uh, neti, 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 when he does, and he kind of eliminates like who you are, and then he gets back to I am that pure awareness, pure consciousness. And I remember he, I think in his childhood, he used to lie down. Do you know that story about him? Yes. The story of Ramana Maharshi's enlightenment. Yes. So what he did was, as you said, he thought, what would it like to be dead? Yeah. I don't think he did it many times. He just did it maybe the once. Okay. He just lay down on the floor in his room uh, and uh, he closed his eyes and pretended very hard to be dead. And he saw that could be that the body is dead. But he realized, I am this awareness beyond the body-mind. He made that breakthrough right there and then. And that's something, notice, it stayed with him effortlessly ever after. Yeah, He did a tremendous amount of like absorptive meditation. Uh, it's not really sadhana, you know. There's a very interesting thing about, uh, about that. Sadhana, the word sadhana means practices. Um, it's uh, used in an instrumental sense. That means... I need to do something, like I need to come to the yoga. So that's my sadhya, the goal. And the sadhan which I use, the, the method or the instrument, would might be the train or the plane. And I am the sadhaka, the practitioner. So I, I, I am the one who's seeking a goal and I do a practice in order to get to the goal. In Ramana Maharshi's case, that's not true. He already made the breakthrough. He was not even looking for enlightenment. He just had this question and then he tried it hard. He imagined it. And then he tried hard and he made the breakthrough. Now, afterwards, you will see, it seems like very hard sadhana. He remained in samadhi for days and days and days on end without any care whether the body lived or not. He just wanted to go away from all distraction and remain absorbed in what he had found. That is so extraordinary. Now, from, a, from the outside, it looks like sadhana. But actually there, he is not seeking something. When we do spiritual practice, we are seeking. We are seeking God or self-knowledge or whatever you call it. But he is not seeking. He's already found it. What he is doing there is, he is staying with what he has found. And it's, it might not be very much in his case uh, like a deliberate practice. Because it's so powerful and so enormously attractive within. He just wants to stay with that. So that was... You might call it a sadhana. It's just staying with the realization that, that he had. Now, will it work if I just lie down on the floor and pretend to be dead? Will I become enlightened? Not necessarily. Most probably it won't work for us. Um, my personal belief and the belief of many um, you know, Vedantins would be he was already a spiritually very advanced person. It just needed a little bit to tip him over into something that probably he had already achieved in earlier lives. And then he remained in that state um, ever after. It, again, I have to be careful. It's not even a state. It's his real nature. States are like states of the mind. Waking is a state of the mind. The same mind goes into another state. It's his dream. It can go into absorptive trance states, meditative state. It can go into a deep sleep state. They are states. But you are not a state. You are the reality to which all states appear and disappear. And Ramana Maharshi was centered in that reality. And... So with him and I leave my body and if I don't get a physical form like immediately because I don't know when that happens. So where will my soul or consciousness, if you call it, will, will, where will it go? Because I've been reading a lot about lokas and other dimensions and life and other planets or dimensions. So is that true? Are there other lokas and where will I go? We, 
we do believe that there are other locusts, but notice the word believe. So it's taken on faith in different religions, just about every religion of the world, all religions of the world. In fact, they talk about a post-mortem existence. If we did not exist after death in some form or the other, religion itself would not be possible. It would be, it would be pointless, sort of. It might be a nice moral exercise while we are alive, but if I'm going to die and nothing is left of me after death, what's the point of it all then? I mean, I could just bear with this life and do whatever I please, because I'll be soon gone. I could lead a reasonably good life or a dissolute life or whatever it is. Very soon it'll be over anyway. If I lead a good life, it might have a good impact on others in the future. But I would be gone. So a purely reductionist, materialist perspective, it makes religion sort of pointless. So all religions think of, um, propose that we exist after death. Hinduism says we existed before death, we will exist, continue to exist after death, and we go through many, many births and life. Uh, so what happens after death, before we take a birth in some other uh, physical form? We go to different locus, which are like different worlds, different spheres of, of experience. Some of them may be unpleasant. They are what are called hells or lower worlds. Some of them may be very pleasant, much better than this. Um, they are more like dreamlike experiences. Some could be a very pleasant dream, some could be nightmares. Um, so we, this uh, Jivatman, it goes to the these different locals based on its past karma. Now, we don't give too much importance to this. We believe in it. We means Vedantins, Advaitins. We believe in all of this. This is there in the Upanishads. This is there in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna teaches it also. It's a common um, belief in all varieties of Hinduism, Buddhism. A religion which does not talk about God, but it still talks about uh, the individual going to different planes of existence after death and then coming back again, propelled by my past karma. So you get different kinds of experiences there and you come back again. But the point is, here and now, I must make this breakthrough and attain to my real nature, realize my own real nature. That is the purpose of this series of continued experiences. Experience in this life, good experiences, awful experiences, experience after death. Experiences in the higher heavens, higher locus, or in the more unpleasant locus. All of this is supposed to push me towards enlightenment. That's the point. Then that's what I should be pursuing now. I'm somehow a product of this particular body, especially the nerve of, of the brain and the nervous system. It's generating consciousness in some way, sentience in some way, and lo and behold, I'm this guy or this, this person. And when this body dies, clearly the brain will die. Clearly the nervous system will die. So the, it will not produce me anymore and I'm gone forever. But then there is this unexamined assumption. Is it true that I, this conscious being, am a product of uh, material processes in this living body? Once the body dies, those processes come to a halt and I'm gone. Is it true? And it so happens that this is the big, the so-called hard problem of consciousness. This is what in the cutting edge of consciousness studies today. This is what researchers, neuroscientists, um, psychologists, philosophers of mind, even the people in AI research, they are beginning to realize you can't reduce consciousness, sentience, down to material processes in the brain and the nervous system. In that case, my argument is, that if the body dies, surely the brain will die. The nervous system will, will die, will perish. But if you can't reduce sentience, consciousness, brain and nervous system, what makes you so sure that the consciousness will not continue even after the death of this body? If it's not being produced by the brain, then it's there now. The brain goes, maybe I lose my, all my ability to interact with the world. It's like a doorway being shut, like the instrument failing. But that if the instrument fails, if the door is shut, doesn't mean I am gone forever. I could still very well be there. Mm -hmm. And I might get a new instrument with which to interact with the world. So when you say you live only once, it's a, it's a um, dangerously limiting philosophy. Because I'm operating on the basis, do whatever I, I, I'm going to do now, and it won't affect anything because after all, I'll be gone very soon. Yeah. Well, suppose you won't be gone very soon. Mm. Then in, in that case, Whatever I'm doing now will be carried forward. Building that karma. We are building that karma. We are building those samskaras, those tendencies. It will be very difficult to fight against and undo 40 years down the line, one or two lives down the line also. That's true. 
It's just saying, right, that when the tree or the plant is small, you can change it, the habits, those things start us, as it keeps growing up, and we don't even know how many lives we've been here for. Yes. So then it's even more difficult, which I can see in myself, like, I, once I began to, like, get awareness, that there's some compulsions I have, yeah. which maybe are from past lives too. So the sooner you become aware, the sooner you can maybe... Careful, live more consciously. Not even prescribing that you do this or do that. More aware of a BR, of what I am, what I'm, what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, and what I'm doing. The better it is for us. So this YOLO is not a new philosophy. Yeah. It's a very ancient philosophy in this land where we are sitting yeah. in, uh, you know, in uh, India. Yeah. Um, there were this ancient school of materialists. They were called the Charvakas, okay. um, and they had exactly the same philosophy. Eat, drink and make merry because once the body is dead, it will be burned and uh, never come back from the ashes. Mm -hmm. So uh, they say, um, borrow money if you must and have fun. Because nobody's going to come and collect uh, your debts anymore. Yeah. So that is the school of materialists. Uh, it's entirely based on the idea that we are body and nothing other than body. And that's now, especially in this time in the 21st century, this is the big question. Are we really... Uh, just the body, just the brain and the nervous system and nothing more. And who's asking this question? Not Vedantists, not Buddhists. The uh, neuroscientists are asking this question. Philosophers of mind today are asking this question. And then Deepak Chopra, Rajiv Mahatra, some people are coming out and, and taking the discussion forward. As well. David Chalmers, um, he's the one who coined the term hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard of Bernardo Castro, uh, of uh, Donald Hoffman. These are people who are seriously questioning whether consciousness can at all be reduced to just body and mind, a bodily function. You spent a lot of time in the Himalayas. Was there any like interesting experience or encounter you had? I, I don't know anything. I mean, I've read about levitation, astral body travel. Something you ever saw like, or experienced that maybe shocked you as well? <laughs> it's not that I spent a lot of time there. I spent a few months okay. um, on uh, different locations. Um, so, but yes, I had a number of interesting experiences. Nothing like people levitating, um, but I met some wonderful monks, uh, practitioners there, and some not so wonderful ones also. So, all in all, it was a very, uh, very uh, sort of colorful experience. I can tell you about this one monk I met um, in Gangotri, high up in the Himalayas. So, this monk, he invited me to and another monk of our order, two of us, we went up with him to where he lived. He literally lived in a hole in the ground, on the, just close to the river, the Ganga, which was just ice melted from the, from the glacier. And he lived on a... Um, he had to crawl inside on all fours. We crawled inside and we followed him inside. It was pitch dark and he sat there. And we asked him, why don't you live up there? There's a big cave, nice cave there. And he said... Well, I wanted to, but there's a bear who lives there, and the bear is a kind of a bully, won't it? <laughs> and so this hole, it's too small for him to, for the bear to enter. So that's why I live in, in this hole. And in that pitch dark, uh, in there, uh, with the roar of the river just a little muted, you know, by the, the rocks, uh, he, I still remember, he explained, he chanted and explained the fourth chapter of the Gita to us. So that I had numerous such experiences, nothing magical or supernatural. Though some monks did tell me about their own experiences. Mm -hmm. I know, um, like my mom's guru is named Kroli Baba. Yes. And I know there's a lot of stories of him where he's, he was out of his body, he used to do astral travel. And sometimes when he would make like puris and there was no oil, and then he would say, go fetch a bucket of water, and then the puris would cook in that water. So, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of Sid, like Ramakrishnan was also considered Sid, right? Yes. yes. Such. Um, such things are possible, such phenomena are possible. Um, for example, the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, speaks about a lot of Siddhais, um, occult powers. Um, I have myself seen a little bit in some uh, case of some monks, just a little bit here and there, like telepathy, or uh, knowing what's in the thoughts of another person. However, I must say that uh, all great spiritual masters have cautioned us against uh, uh, pursuing these powers. They are so attractive um, that they can easily deviate a spiritual seeker from 
their uh, spiritual goal. So just imagine, in this world, people are attracted by wealth or beauty or power or learning. So these are worldly powers. You can call them powers. Um, so these occult powers are even more attractive than this. And that's why many spiritual seekers in different religions of the world, it's not just that yogis get it, anybody who engages in some serious spiritual pursuit is likely to develop some such powers. Yogis get it in a very powerful sense because, uh, uh, because those practices are designed to evoke, to, to awaken this uh, energy. But even if you're a devotee who is devoted to God, Bhakti, or even in the path of um, uh, Vedantic inquiry, because you are oriented towards the ultimate reality, you will come across some of these phenomena. But we are strongly advised to keep our eyes on the goal and carefully avoid all this. Because could these, even if you get these cities, there's a chance that you become egotistical. and Egotistical, addicted to them. Someone like Neem Karoli Baba or other great masters, they were already fully realized. And even when they did use these cities, they had these powers. It was mostly for the purpose of uh, benefit of others and um, not to glorify themselves. Maybe just to create a little bit of faith in people who, did, who were still a little shaky. Whether such a thing is possible. Does God exist? Does what religion says, is it true? Sometimes such demonstrations might attract people. But that's it. They are, they are not, not very useful after that. But this uh, grace or kripa from a uh, fully realized you know, saints or someone with enlightenment, does it actually help you if you travel? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up. Of all the spiritual powers, so-called occult powers, far higher, far greater is this grace you're talking about. This is a power, but it comes straight from God, from Ishwara or Manuvan. The effect of this power is always one, that it awakens spirituality in others. So, um, something that was sort of theoretical for me suddenly becomes real. You really, really, for example, believe in the existence of God if you're in the path of bhakti or if you're path of meditation. You were trying all these years to concentrate. Maybe your mind was fickle. We are slowly progressing and not progressing. We didn't know. Everything seemed mechanical. Suddenly it comes alive. And you are absorbed in deep meditation for the first time. Um, you are like sucked into it. And still, the mind is still. That is grace. Or in the path of knowledge. You are reading all these books and thinking and trying this meditation, that meditation, these uh, pointing out uh, pointers and you know... Uh, and all of it still seemed intellectual, not quite real. But suddenly you see, it's like the curtain Light. is, uh, yeah, the curtain is removed. Um, and you begin to see what all these texts were talking about. Now you know, you don't know, you're no longer seeking. Now you know very clearly. Now the text starts speaking to you because you are in sync, in tune with what they're trying to say. All of this is, there's some, some grace there because you realize it is not really a direct uh, result of my efforts. It's not. It's not. You have to. Yeah, you have to make the effort. But the effort is just like saying that I want it. You go to your mother and you must um, you know, make a fuss. I want this. Yeah. But when it, it's given to you, it's given by the mother. Yeah. It's not really, you didn't get it by yourself. But you made the demand. So our sadhana, you can think of it, our spiritual practices, what we do, devotion, meditation, Vedantic inquiry, whatever it is. It's like a child demanding something uh, from God, the universe, or whatever it is. And then the answer comes. That's great. Just before, like, we took our flight from Delhi. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have, we have a Kalima Murti in our home, like this big. And uh, she was there with all the other gods and goddesses. So I took her out from the play and I put her in front and I started crying and, like, shedding tears. And I said, Swami Sarvapinandaji is in India, Maka, where you have to you know, make me do a like episode with him. This is the only thing I want. And I said that, you know, just like Ramakrishnanji told the Vekarandaji to ask him, I am asking you this. And then it was, I believe in this 100% and it's happened. See, and it happened. Yeah. And it works. It does. Why did God, who loves us so much, make this world? That's a old, old question and important question. The religions of the world, which the religions which believe in God, they have to answer this question because they have to this is the question posed to them if there is a god at all 
um, God is powerful enough to create this world and is a good and loving God. Yeah. So good and loving and omnipotent, all powerful. If you put them together, in that case, why is there uh, suffering? Why is there evil? Yeah. Like a good parent. See, parents want the best for us, for, for the children. But they are human parents, so they don't have the power to make everything all right for us. But if they could, they would. No, all parents would want that the children would not suffer. So God is our parent, father or mother. Why would God make us suffer? This is the question. Yeah. Um, in theology, this is called the problem of evil. Problem of suffering, problem of evil. Notice this arises only in the God-centered religions. If you in Christianity or Islam or in, in uh, Hinduism, you have Vaishnavism, Shaktism, Shaivism. If God exists in this. So God is the center of that religion. If you don't have a God-centered religion, the question doesn't arise. If you ask this question to a Buddhist, why is there so much suffering? The answer will be, that's the nature of this world. Why did God create this world? They will say, God did not create this world. It's a material world. It's come up through material processes. And it's the very nature of this world that because of continuous change and our tendency to grasp what we like and fear what we do not like, the whole thing is changing. The result will be suffering. I like this thing, this place, this person, this job, this, uh, this money, this social media, um, you know, likes. Yeah. And I want to hold on to it. I have more and more of it. But it keeps on changing. So it will never be what I want it to be. Even if it is what exactly I want it to be next moment, it will change. So it will produce suffering. And there are certain things I don't like in this world. I don't want to be ill. I don't want to be disliked. I don't want to fail. I, I don't want to be dishonored. But because everything is continuously changing, some of those things will also come my way. And they will go away again. The very nature of the world is such, the answer of the Buddhist will give you, the very nature of the world is such that it produces suffering. This was the Buddha's first noble truth that there is suffering. Sarvam Dukkham. Suffering is all pervasive because this is the very nature of the world. Um, from a, from a God-centered perspective, in Hinduism, what would the answer be? There are multiple answers. Uh, there is a book by Arthur Herman, mm. the problem of evil in uh, Indian thought and the problem of evil. There he doesn't limit himself just to Indian systems. He looks across the world, all religions, and then he finds 23 answers to your question. 23 answers. So I suggest that book. None of those answers are very satisfying, but these are answers proposed by different religions, different times. You might be curious, what are these answers like? And give you a few of them. One answer is that uh, God made this, um, this suffering in order to develop our character. Through suffering, one becomes strong. Now, we might say, hmm, it seems reasonable only in some cases that we go through a lot of suffering and we emerge stronger after that. But um, a child who's born and is ill or starving and dies. How did it, that child become stronger through that suffering? It's died. Um, and animals in the world suffer all the time. All you know, in nature is full of suffering. How are they becoming stronger by that suffering? So there's a limitation to that. You know, it's called character building uh, theory. It's, it's a very limited kind of theory that doesn't explain most of suffering in the world. Which is your favorite? Or right. So I will say two. One is the one which Professor Herman also suggests, the theory of karma, causality. Everything is cause and effect in this world. Actions have consequences. Causes will have effects. So whatever we see happening in this world around us is a result of past karma. My own karma, everybody else's karma, the community's karma, all of that comes to fruition in front of me. And what do we do with this? What we do with this is that what we are doing now what I'm thinking, saying, doing is generating future karma. So if what I am now is the result of my past karma, what I will be in the future will be the result of my present karma. So you should interpret it not in a fatalistic way. Yeah. This is all my karma, what do I do? No, uh, it should be interpreted in a positive way. Um, so this is one theory, the law of karma. The um, ultimate theory which I like the Sri Ramakrishna was once asked the same question. Why is there so much suffering in the world? He gave three levels of answers. The first level he said, it's um, God is doing this, we can't understand. That seems like 
over simplistic but it just might be true there might be things which are beyond literally beyond our understanding it could be that god is good god is loving loving and yet permits all this suffering maybe but for what reason we cannot understand it could be one answer the person who asked him this question was not satisfied he again asked no 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 why is this over suffering the second answer which sri ramakrishna gave was this is the lay, the leela the play of god again that person was now outraged he said play of god but it is death for us it's the his or her play is death for us third answer sri ramakrishna gave and that's my favorite answer for that there's no reply I and mean, there's no come back to that so it's death for us and sri ramakrishna said but who are you how is that an answer if we investigate who i am then i come to a realization that i am one with god in my own divine nature nature there is actually no suffering the one who is suffering and the one who has created this entire you know, this play they are one and the same if i ask in my dream or nightmare why am i suffering the answer would be that this is a dream so nightmare wake up you'll see it's all right so this the that that answer which is my favorite is when put it in one word it's maya so karma uh, leela maya take your pick thank you so much